Yeah, I still am. I'm researching. Chris Bojalian and Eric Nazarian. 
Now, I would like to introduce our host for this evening here at the UCLA Faculty Center. Without Professor uh, Peter Cowie, we would not be here tonight. <laughs> Professor Peter Cowie is the Naragatsi Chairholder in Armenian Studies at UCLA. The Naragatsi Chair at UCLA was uh, established by Nasser uh, several decades ago. Peter Cowie has uh, authored five books and he's edited nine. His latest work, The Armenians, Religious and Cultural Interchange Across the Mediterranean and Near Eastern World, is about to be published. Like many of you in the audience, I consider myself a major user of the outputs of Armenian studies. Armenian studies needs to be supported. That is why I really admire Peter Cowie, because uh, uh, he is preparing the next generation of Armenian and non-Armenian uh, scholars to study Armenian studies. On February 12th, 2016, uh, only a few weeks ago, Professor Cowie welcomed graduate students from Armenia, Germany, England, Switzerland, Hungary, Russia, and the United States to the 14th annual Graduate Student Colloquium. The Los Angeles community had the opportunity to hear the latest developments in Armenian studies. One of the display boards to, the, to, to my left uh, is dedicated to that uh, colloquium, which uh, Nasser uh, modestly supports. Peter Cowie, I congratulate you on hosting a very successful 14th annual graduate colloquium in Armenian studies, and now I invite you to the podium to make your remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rupen. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I'm sure most of you know, and uh, um, in fact, Rupen just mentioned, Nasser was responsible for founding the Nadegatsi chair in the 1960s, together with the Mashtots chair at Harvard, which meant that Armenian studies entered the academy together with Middle Eastern studies in general, as the government realized the importance of the whole region for the US from its experience in the Second World War. The founding generation of Nasser were thus very far-sighted in their appreciation of the imperative of armonology joining those other disciplines at the university level. Alongside Manuk Yang in Boston were activists here like Dr. Michael Hagopian, Dr. and Mrs. Pierre and Alice Haig, and George Mekjan. The program they founded has developed into one of the largest of its kind outside Yerevan, and has sought not only to maintain high standards, but to become an innovator in the field. In language, it provides instruction in all three standards of Armenian, Eastern, Western, and Classical. My colleague, Dr. Anahid Kashishyan Aramuni, has been innovative in employing drama as a means of language acquisition. Last year, directing a high energy reenactment of the Epic of Sasu, which enjoyed public performances locally and in Yerevan. Similarly, our recent PhD graduate, Dr. Shushan Garabedian, has been active in formulating a new pedagogical approach for heritage speakers, identifying their profile and gearing the whole curriculum to developing the further registers they require. Meanwhile, my colleague in Western Armenian, Dr. Hagob Gulujan, is a sought-after expert in current discussions on revamping the employment of Western Armenian in the community uh, at large, not only as a lingering element of the past, but as a creative aspect of cultural discourse that is taking out a niche for itself for the future. In that regard, I'm proud that even our non-Armenian graduate students wish to perfect their practical command of the language to be able to interact with Armenian scholars in Armenian, to present conference papers in Armenian, and to submit articles for publication in Armenian journals. Likewise, in cultural history, we espouse a broad vision of evolution in order to better understand its continuities and discontinuities, interpreting it not purely in terms of its presence in the Caucasus, but also as a multinodal diasporic community from the medieval kingdom of Cilicia onwards, 
international in perspective and plugged into trends worldwide. Thus, the approach is not isolationist, but integrationist, inclusivist, not exclusionary. Hence, the Armenian polity is important, not only for what it achieved at home, but also for the contribution that Armenians have made to the development of much larger networks of exchange, initially across the Northern Hemisphere and thereafter globally. I'm delighted to witness the recommitment and reactivation of Nasser and its local leadership in California, which this dinner celebrates, and, command, uh, and commend its support uh, of a new generation of scholars in Armenian studies. A number of our graduate students have benefited from NASA support to conduct research projects. Danny Fitante, who is currently teaching at AUA, was able to research the Armenian diaspora in Moscow, which he is now writing up for publication. Similarly, Anatoly Tokmansev has been a recipient of travel funds to pursue fieldwork with ethnic and religious minorities in the Armenian Republic and J.D. Tima Steele was awarded a grant to visit Istanbul to collect sources at the Armenian Patriarchate to document the development of agency on the part of Ottoman Armenian women over the second half of the 19th century. Nasser uh, has also been a valued co-sponsor, as mentioned uh, uh, previously, of our uh, annual graduate student colloquium in Armenian studies. Last year, UCLA signed a Memorandum of Understanding with AUA, building on which I'm organizing a workshop next month on the contemporary construction of Armenian identity uh, at the AUA campus, pooling the resources of the graduate programs of UCLA, AUA, and the Institute of Ethnography in Yerevan to explore the theme from a variety of perspectives over our spring break. Here, too, I'm grateful to Nasser for its co-sponsorship of the event, the proceedings of which we plan to publish online through the California Digital Library. In view of the results of our cooperation with Nasser so far, which I briefly summarized, I look forward to continuing the partnership for many years to come and wish Nasser every success in all its activities to promote Armenian studies both locally and nationally. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's MC the acclaimed documentary filmmaker and journalist, Dr. Carla Karabedyan. Born in the US, Dr. Karabedyan grew up in Los Angeles to a family originating in the cities of Van and Sivas in the former Ottoman Empire. She earned her undergraduate and doctoral degrees in international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science. A former journalist for the BBC, she is the only American ever to have anchored its world news program. Since 1990, she has directed documentary films about pressing issues in world affairs, including Dying for the President on Russia, Children of the Secret State on North Korea, Lifting the Veil on Afghanistan, as well as Forbidden Iran. Her film on the Armenian genocide, Screamers, featuring System of a Down, was shown in movie theaters across America and has now been translated into 13 languages. Carla has led the Armenian Film Foundation's project to digitize 400 Armenian genocide testimonies filmed by Dr. J. Michael Hagopian. These are now available to view at the USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive. This year she was in Spain working on the movie The Promise with Christian Bale. She has just returned from Berlin, where she is in pre-production for her next movie. So without further ado, let me call Dr. Garabed Young. Thank you for that kind introduction, and what a pleasure to see all of you here. So many friends, so many um, people who support Nasser and support the community. And you know, I was thinking as I was talking to so many of you, uh, last year was a big year. We know it was a big year. Um, so many projects, so many books and concerts, and so many um, efforts by people in, in our community. It was a big year, but you know something that I personally learned from all of that was um, it wasn't an ending, it was actually a beginning. 
and that it, it showed us who we who we are and what we can do, but also what more there is to do. And and I think Nasser is a, a prime example of uh, the projects that we need to continue to support and the work we still have to do. Um, and of course, this evening is about not just scholarship, but also culture and how the two things, history, culture, come together. And we'll be hearing more about that after dinner. Um, so before that, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping um, before we enjoy our dinner. I first want to thank um, those people on the Nasser Organizing Committee who have organized this event. All of the members are listed um, in the program you have on the table. And I'd also like to acknowledge the five Nasser Executive Committee members who have traveled here from the East Coast to be with us tonight. And they are Sarah Ignatius, Yervant Chekichan, Nancy Kaligian, Jack Mazzorian, and Stepan Paligian. Thank you, thank you for joining us here tonight for this special meeting. I would also like to acknowledge um, the Armenian Studies scholars that we have with us tonight. We've, of course, just heard from Professor Cowie. We have Professor Hovanisian, who is joining us here, and Professor Dekmejan from the other university. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hago Golujian, he is joining us, and Professor Rubina Purumian. Thank you. if I've missed anybody. Um, I'd also like to honor the AGSA, the UCLA Armenian Graduate Students Colloquium. They were just mentioned. Um, we invited some of the grad students. I think a few of them are here today. Are there, are there any of the students here? Yep, there they are. Thank you for coming. And last but not least, we are very, very grateful for the support of our sponsors who are listed in the program. We appreciate your generous contribution tonight. You've made it happen, not just this venue, but sponsoring the, the academics who are here with us. Thank you. And, and now, we are going to break for dinner. Our program will commence after dinner. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit more also about what Nasser is doing after dinner, but for now, um, we want you to enjoy the meal, and we're going to be announcing the tables um, one by one. So I think, um, yes, here we go. Okay. So hang on to your hats, here we go. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge uh, Salpi because uh, she represents the Armenian Institute uh, at the USC. So we're very grateful to have Salpi here. Uh, please um, provide, uh, we'd like you to accept uh, some patients. We're going to start with table six and then we're going to go on to table four. Please wait until table six comes back and then I'll come and individually uh, tell which table to go next. So please, table six begin.
Are you taking my car? Oh, you can't do that. It's illegal. I'm running in. To begin our program, um, with a presentation about Nasser and um, its new initiatives. And I'd like to introduce Sarah Ignatius. Sarah, who has come from Boston, is Nasser's first executive director, effective from the first of this year. She earned a JD from Georgetown University. and a BA from Stanford University. She served on Nasser's Board of Directors since 2014 and on its Executive Committee as Treasurer. Her interest in Armenian Studies deepened after she went on the 2006 Nasser tour to Armenia and Historic Armenia. And there's some photographs here along the side if you haven't seen some of these tours. I know some of you have been on these tours. And in fact, Michael Hagopian filmed one of the first of these tours that Nasser did in the 60s. Um, upon returning from the 2006 trip, Sarah drafted a young adult manuscript called The Devil's Kaleidoscope, and it's about a 14-year-old Armenian boy caught up in the genocide. That manuscript has received recognition from the New England Society of Children's Books, writers and illustrators, the National League of American Pen Women, and the Somerville Arts Council. She's worked for more than 25 years as a lawyer and executive director, primarily with the Political Asylum Immigration Representation Project in Boston, defending people fleeing from persecution worldwide. She taught immigration and asylum law at Boston College Law School for 10 years, co-authored Immigration Law and the Family, and authored a national asylum study for Harvard Law School. We're very happy to have her here tonight. Please welcome Sarah Ignatius. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Carla, for that very warm and generous introduction. Uh, I'm just very honored and uh, proud to be here tonight and I had to have Carla as our Master of Ceremonies. I think all of us really um, feel awed by your dedication and the conscience that seems to drive all the work that you do to bring to light the unpleasant truth in dangerous places. So I think we all owe you a debt and uh, we're really happy that you're with us here tonight. Uh, thank you to Peter Cowley. Uh, we've had wonderful dinner t conversation and um, it's just been a pleasure to get to know you, but thank you so much for being our host tonight. And thanks, of course, to the uh, very active Los Angeles committee who put this delicious dinner together for all of us and wonderful evening. I also want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your support. I've really loved getting to know all of you who I've spoken to so far and those that I haven't yet. I do hope I'll have the chance either tonight or at some other moment. I especially want to thank my parents for coming, uh, Paul and Nancy Ignatius. They've flown out from Washington, D.C. And at 95 and 90, they just never slow down. executive director at Nasser, and uh, it's obviously a daunting task, uh, very challenging, but extremely rewarding. It's perfect that my first trip for Nasser is out here to Southern California, because my grandfather, Hovzep Ignatius, was central to the Armenian community in the Los Angeles area when he was alive. He was involved in the early days of Nasser's campaigns for chairs of Armenian studies. So when I went to work my first day, uh, Manu Young, the founder of Nasser, was a meticulous record keeper. So I went to a bank of steel gray file cabinets <coughs> that archived the correspondence and pulled out the drawer that had the letters from people whose names began with I and found letters that, uh, carbon copies of letters 
that Monica had typed to my grandfather. And then I found my grandfather's loopy, indecipherable, indecipherable cursive handwriting responding to Monica again sending a donation uh, to support the Armenian Studies Chair campaign. So I Xeroxed one of my grandfather's letters and I have it in a frame on my desk. And I'm sure that my grandfather never for one minute imagined that one of his granddaughters would be working at Nasser in uh, Manuk's own office. So even though my grandfather figured we could do anything, uh, he probably never imagined this. I'm sure he'd be very proud and I'm just very uh, grateful and thankful to be here. So, uh, as you know, Nasser's primary mission is fostering Armenian studies, building community worldwide uh, to preserve Armenian culture, history, and identity for future generations. So in our founding mission, as people have said, the idea initially was to establish chairs of Armenian studies in America's foremost institutions of higher education. So the Harvard chair was uh, first out of the box. And uh, we have the old, perhaps some of you have seen this, the old black and white photograph uh, in uh, 1959. Nasser was founded in 1955, but there's the photograph of the victory banquet where Manuk is handing a check to the then president of Harvard, Nathan Pusey, while Ruben Mamoyan looks on. And uh, it's really a treasure to see uh, how the vision came through so strongly at that time in the first community-funded chair at Harvard, and maybe it still is the only community-funded chair at Harvard. About at that same time, this was in May of 1959, J. Michael Hagopian wrote uh, the dean of UCLA that NASA was interested in working towards establishing a chair in California as well. And so the then UCLA president, Clark Kerr, responded and said that he hoped that the uh, first chair in California would be at UCLA, which it was. Uh, <clears throat> Since that time, there are uh, over 13, there are 13 endowed programs at universities uh, in the United States and many other non-endowed Armenian studies programs and uh, scholars who've written hundreds of books about Armenian history and culture uh, and as well as about the genocide. Nasser's mission still um, is as relevant today as it was back then. After the 100-year commemoration of the genocide, we're on the threshold of a new era, defined by our culture and our accomplishments and our identity and our relationship with the Republic of Armenia. I'm half Armenian, and my son is one quarter Armenian. So Nasser's role as a repository of our language, history, and culture, as well as a center for learning, uh, outreach, and connections is precisely in the interest of our children and grandchildren to stimulate their shared sense of identity with Armenians around the globe and to build community worldwide. I'm proud and happy that the uh, members of NASA and the Los Angeles community have been so active and as Professor Cowie mentioned already, some of the ways in which um, he and his students have worked together with NASA, we're very grateful for that. I also uh, feel that we really have to start where all things begin in Armenian studies. Uh, where would any of us be without Professor Richard Hovanissian, who's here tonight with his <laughs> Uh, a poster of a talk that Richard Hovanissian was giving on behalf of Nasser in Pasadena, has his picture. Uh, the date of the talk 
was in February of 1963. So given that Professor Hovhannisian just last week spoke in Glendale at the Goodbye and Torah event on behalf of Nasser, I'm sure he set a longevity record, and we thank you for it. And I also want to thank him and Armin Arroyan, who's also here for leading a number of the Nasser tours that Carla mentioned. Um, Unfortunately, not the one we went on, although that was also excellent. But I hope at some point in the near future, the world will be stable enough that we'll be able to plan another tour. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very proud of our relationship in supporting uh, the academic conferences at UCLA, including the UCLA Colloquium that Peter Cowie mentioned. And uh, Rupen Barbarian and I have worked out a tag team where he takes beautiful photos, does a write-up, and sends them to me and, uh, in my novice way, posts them on Facebook. So take a look, they're up and they look very beautiful. But uh, it's really wonderful to be able to recognize the great work that the students have done and their diversity, which we try to capture uh, on our Facebook page, so thank you. Uh, we're also really proud to support the UCLA um, conference in Yerevan that Professor Cowie mentioned on identity that will be with the American University uh, of Armenia. Nasser, as you know, uh, sponsors, co-sponsors a number of events uh, in this area, uh, many of them with the Ararat, beautiful Ararat Deskitchen Museum and with other organizations, uh, such as the one recently, very well attended one recently in Glendale on Goodbye on, on Tura. There's so much more to say, but what I want to do is just jump uh, to 2016. What's new for 2016? So our lecture series, uh, which has been very diverse, uh, will be even more diverse and innovative in, uh, in this year and in coming years. Last year we presented over 40 programs uh, on a wide range of topics, you know, from history, uh, aspects of the genocide all the way to current day issues. Uh, obviously we have a number of programs in the greater Boston area and in uh, this area, also in the New York, New Jersey area, a uh, couple in Fresno and in uh, Washington DC. We started a new lecture series about, series about modern day realities and uh, topics really of interest to the next generation. So last week at Northeastern University, uh, Nasser hosted a stellar panel of articulate, uh, no way to say it, articulate women. Uh, they were really fantastic. Four out of the five presenters were women. And they were all talking about the uh, realities of political, social, and economic realities of Artsakh. Uh, we do have photos of that on our Facebook page too. <laughs> I can't believe it. <coughs> Push in social media. Uh, but, and last year in the same lecture series, we uh, did our first panel on Armenian identity, also at Northeastern, and the second one on opportunities for people in the diaspora uh, to assist in economic development uh, in the Republic of Armenia so, at MIT. So we hope to continue, program, continue programming, programming along those lines. and. Uh, and hope really to draw in uh, people uh, of a broader uh, background, younger generation, uh, who are more interested uh, to some degree um, in modern day issues. We also will be giving, and already have started giving more lectures about Armenians in other parts of the world. So for example, coming up in March, will be a lecture on Armenian communities in China from 1880 to the 1950s. It's the lecture's entitled, Don't Fall Off the Earth. It's Kajik Muradian's lecture. Uh, then just this week, we missed it because we were out here, but Ani Babayan, who's the Nasser librarian, she gave a talk about uh, Armenian women in Iran. And then Talin Suchian will be lecturing on Armenians in modern Turkey in April. We're also going to be looking at slightly edgy topics. 
you think I'm exaggerating, but uh, so after last year in um, sponsoring Eric Bogosian's uh, tours both on the east and west coast of his book Operation Nemesis, which was about assassins of the uh, key architects of the genocide, and also sponsoring uh, Mary McCurdy, whose own grandfather was the Operation Nemesis accountant and uh, kept that a secret from his family. It wasn't until after he passed away that Marion even realized that about her grandfather. Um, we are delving into uh, the question of armed resistance and co-sponsoring with a Mash Touch chair at Harvard, a symposium in March from Musada to the Warsaw Ghetto, Armenian and Jewish Armed Resistance to Genocide. So perhaps you're thinking, great, they're all in Massachusetts. But uh, you can watch Nasser lectures, many of them, on YouTube. Nasser has a YouTube channel. Despite our 60-year, perhaps somewhat creaky history, uh, we've emerged with a YouTube channel. And we're trying to upload videos of our current programming and then go through the programs in the past. And if you don't believe me, just watch. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> we've launched our online bookstore. Probably you don't believe that either, but uh, we did. So I know it's very long in coming. Thank you for your patience. We don't have all of our titles up yet. Uh, we probably are the largest bookseller of Armenian books in the English language. Mm -hmm. And we have over 1,700 active titles and uh, several thousand in total. So we've launched, it's kind of a soft launch, you're making sure that all the glitches are worked out. But there are about 300 titles, we tried to do the most recent first. So please, go to our website, nasser.org, see if you can order a book, hopefully you can. Uh, let me know if you can't, but uh, we're really trying to step into the digital age and be uh, much more available to people wherever they are. And the bookstore, as you probably know, has a tremendous range of books. So we do have books, of course, on the genocide and memoirs, but we have postcards from the Ottoman Empire, uh, historical atlas atlases, but we also have guidebooks to uh, modern-day Armenia and Karabakh, and uh, fantastic novels by people like Chris Bojallian, uh, his latest book is on sale at the guest room, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet, which hopefully he'll speak about briefly when uh, in just a few minutes he also talks about the Sandcastle Girls. Uh, we are supporting major conferences and symposia. We did a lot of that last year, of course. There were seven different conferences. I won't list them uh, in different parts of the country. So when I say we, uh, I really mean Mark Mamagonian, who a lot of you know, who really wanted to be here also, but uh, somebody had to stay and hold down the fort. So Mark, in case anybody's wondering, is still the academic director at NASA. My job is really to allow him to be that academic director and do his work uh, fully. So we will continue to sponsor major conferences, and at the moment we are sponsoring Armenians in the Cold co-sponsoring. I'm sorry, Armenians in the Cold War in April at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. Uh, similarly, we're working on co-sponsorship of international conferences and also collaborating with the Armenian Genocide Museum, particularly in the area of books, uh, where we have duplicates or other books that may be of great interest. Uh, to the Genocide Museum and uh, with a couple other organizations in Armenia. We also uh, last year awarded the first of its kind uh, book prizes for excellence in Armenian studies and this is because of the generosity of Dr. Sona Aronian who recently passed away but she endowed these two prizes and actually the uh, book and translation that won the award it was the first it's the first of its kind which we awarded last year uh, was for the work on Savalia Science books. And we will continue our grants to scholars. Uh, just to give you a, a number in the last nine years, NASA, in partnership with the Knights of Arctan Fund for Armenian Studies, has provided support, critical support with over 75 separate awards to scholars in the U.S. and abroad. 
of the last four wire transfers I've done, two went to uh, Istanbul and two went to Yerevan. And Professor Cowie mentioned uh, some of the work that some scholars have done with the grant. Which uh, brings me to the Nasser Library. I think without anybody really realizing it, uh, over the years the Nasser Library has grown tremendously. So it is now, it now has 25,000 volumes. It's projected to expand by about 50% uh, as we finish taking possession of a, a very large donation of about eight to 10,000 additional books. And so it's really becoming a world-class library. Uh, most of the books are in Armenian, but not all. And they're, some, uh, they're on a wide range of topics dating back to the 18th century. It is uh, unique in the sense, well, it's probably one of the top three uh, libraries that's in the world that's publicly accessible, uh, meaning that anyone is welcome to come use the library. You don't have to be a student of anywhere um, to use it, or even better, call Mark and he'd be delighted to do the research for you. So that's a service that Nasser is very proud to offer, happy to do, and we really have a world-class library in our building now. And if you can't read Armenian, we just took possession of the Lord Byron Armenian English Grammar Book, first edition, published on San Lazaro, uh, who's printing the English poet funded himself in 1817. So you can take a look at that. I think the openness and accessibility of our library really reflects Nasser's unique value in everything that we do. We are nonpartisan, nonpolitical, nonsectarian, hub for scholars, university programs, authors, researchers, students, and the public. What we're trying to do is promote connections among scholars, scholars to the public, researchers to the rich material that we have in our library, authors and scholars to the general public through their presentations and through the bookstore, Armenians to our own culture, and the world to Armenia's past and present. So in closing, I really want to emphasize that the leadership circle is uh, a key to our financial stability and our success. We really can't do all of this without you. And if you are already a leadership circle member, I really thank you very much. If not, I really hope you'll consider uh, becoming a member uh, to help support our innovative programming, our grants to scholars, and university conferences the international connections that we're forging, our openness and our embrace of the digital age as we try to build community worldwide. I look forward to working with all of you in 2016 and to benefiting from your thoughts, your advice, your feedback, good or bad, your enthusiasm and to help keep us strong and to help keep us relevant in the years to come. And I hope that I'll see you next year at the Leadership Circle event and please save the date. Nasser is celebrating its 60th anniversary in November, uh, on November the 12th, in the Boston area. So I hope all of you can come to that. And I don't want to take any more of your time, but I just want to say how grateful I am that all of you are here and how honored we are to have our stellar presenters who will take the stage in just a minute, uh, Chris, Eric, uh, who will be interviewed by Mark, Rx, and Carla for serving as our host. So thanks a lot, and uh, really appreciate your support, and very humbled to be part of Nasser. The Herculean task of introducing them. And uh, what, what's, the way we're going to do this is that um, once they're introduced, they're going to have a conversation amongst themselves, and there will be some time afterwards to have some questions. So if you have a question, you know, sort of keep it in your mind, and, and uh, there will be time to have a discussion afterwards. So um, Chris Bajalian, 
is the author of 18 books, including his new novel, The Guest Room. His work has been translated into over 30 languages and adapted three times as movies. His books have been chosen as Best Books of the Year by the Washington Post, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Hartford Current, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, Kirkus Review, Book Page, and Salon. His awards include the ANCA Freedom Award for his work educating Americans about the Armenian Genocide, the ANCA Arts and Letters Award for the Sandcastle Girls, as well as the St. Mesro Mashtots Medal, the New England Society Book Award for the Night Strangers. I'm telling you this list because it's so impressive, I think you have to hear it. This is, I mean, I'm going to, bear with me. The New England Book Award, Russia's Soglasi Concord Award for the Sandcastle Girls, a Boston Public Library Literary Light. He was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Transistor Radio and the Anheed Literary Award. His novel, Midwives, was a number one New York Times bestseller, a selection of Oprah's Book Club, and a New England Booksellers Association discovery pick. What an impressive list there. Um, moving on to Eric, Eric Nazarian. An acclaimed screenwriter, director, and producer. Born in Armenia and raised in Los Angeles, Eric holds a Bachelor of Arts in Film Production from the USC School of Cinematic Arts. The Blue Hour, his first feature film, premiered at the 55th San Sebastian International Film Festival, receiving several awards on the International Film Festival circuit. In 2008, Eric received the very prestigious and very competitive Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science Nickel Fellowship in screenwriting for his screenplay, Giants. In 2010, he made Bolis, a short film about a descendant of a genocide survivor in Istanbul, as part of the European Union's Capital of Culture program. Eric is currently working on the film adaptation of The Sandcastle Girls, Chris Bajalian's critically acclaimed best-selling novel. He has lectured on the origins of cinema and on the Armenian Genocide on campuses across the United States and Europe. He is a member of the Writers Guild of America West and a fellow of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies. And finally, Mark Audox. Mark Audox is, as many of you know, a distinguished investigative reporter <coughs> and a gifted writer. His Los Angeles Times stories revealing state-sanctioned murder and cover-up in California prisons were praised by The Nation magazine as, quote, one of the great journalistic achievements of the decade. Mark's first book, In My Father's Name, is a stirring memoir that weaves together the history of his, his Armenian family and hometown of Fresno with his decade-long search to find the man who murdered his father in 1972. His second book, the best-selling The King of California, co-authored with Rick Wartsman, was named one of the top ten books of the year by the Los Angeles Times and the San Francisco Chronicle. And it won a 2004 California Book Award and the 2005 William Saroyan International Writing Prize. His third book, a 2009 collection of stories called West of the West, Dreamers, Believers, Builders, and Killers in the Golden State, received critical acclaim in the Atlantic Monthly and Los Angeles Times, as well as a star review in Publishers Weekly, which compared Mark's essays to the great social portraits of Joan Didion and William Saroyan. A top graduate of Fresno State and Columbia University, Mark left the Los Angeles Times in 2007 after a public fight over censorship of his story on the Armenian Genocide. Mark has taught literary nonfiction at Claremont McKenna College and Fresno State University and served as a senior policy director for the California Senate Majority Leader. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our distinguished speakers for tonight. Thank you, Carla. A very stirring introduction. I feel like putting on my football helmet again and going out and playing. Um, 
I was in a vineyard north of the San Joaquin River a few weeks ago in a place called Red Top. Red Top. <laughs> and uh, I got a call from Eric. He says, do you want to moderate this panel? And I've been working on this book about California water for the past two years. It's a mammoth project. I'm in the middle of it. And I haven't been anywhere in two years, okay, except places like Red Top. So I said, sure. The one I do for Eric in a second. And then it was the great added bonus of meeting Chris. And uh, yeah, I've admired his stuff. I mean, you just read, I, I've done three books in 20 years, four actually. Uh, this guy's done four books since, since Sandcastle Girl. So, <laughs> what the hell's going on here? And, uh, so, I'm, after this water book, I'm turning to fiction. <laughs> and I am. I was halfway in a book protagonist called Nish Hosepian. So, anyhow, I'd also do this for Nasser. I remember my first book tour around the country. I was in Houston, Texas. Four Armenians showed up to a bookstore there. One of them was Lucy Soroy and William's daughter, um, which was a trip because I hung out with Lucy afterwards. And I called John Baronian because one of my next stops was going to be Boston and Nasser was putting on this event. And I said, Mr. Bronian, four Armenians showed up at a bookstore in Houston. Do you think we can get a few more Armenians than that? He goes, oh, of course. Well, I was worried because it was 20 years ago on Oscar night that I showed up in Boston. Wow. And I walked into this auditorium. And Paul, you can attest to this. There were 400 Armenians in that thing. It was a magnificent evening. And so I owe a lot to, to Nasser. So anyhow, I'm proud to be here. Happy to see all you guys. And we're going to have a kind of lively, informal discussion. We won't make it real, real long. But hopefully it'll keep you guys awake. So I want to start. With, I think the, the way to do this is to talk to Chris first about the Sandcastle Girls, the plotting of it, um, how he used, you know, we all get hung up. Is, is, is fiction have any truth in it? Does nonfiction have any untruth in it? Well, the answer is yes to both. I mean, when you're writing nonfiction, you're using fiction techniques, and so you're 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 lying all the time. Um, not really. Uh, and he's. I, I'm assuming that some of his life got incorporated into this book, even though the narrator, shall we say, well, is one of the characters is a female. And I think Chris is going to tell us that he turned himself into a female. No? No, probably not. But we're going to ask that. Okay. So the first question I have is, just in terms of background, um, I'm always fascinated how the genocide played out in your childhood. When I read Peter Balakian's Black Dog of Faith, I had a hard time believing that he had never heard about the genocide until he was like 20 years old and an African-American guy at work told him about it. So I don't know if this was a function of, of, of a narrative device or it was actually true, but I always thought, geez, on the East Coast, they don't know about the genocide? I mean, we, we grew up with that. So I want to ask you a little bit about your background and then how that got incorporated, the, the real of your life, into the fiction of this book. Sure. First of all, Mark, thank you for being here, Carla. Thank you for that introduction. And I, too, want to thank everyone at Nasser. I can't tell you how many times when I was writing The Sandcastle Girls, I was depending upon the scholarship of wonderful Armenian men and women who've been writing the books that allow me to write fiction. And, just for the record, on two different occasions when I've written op-eds for the Washington Post or the Boston Globe about the Armenian Genocide, to verify what I was stating in the Abed, I depended on screenshots from one of Dr. Hovhannessian's books, sending it to my editors so there could be no question that, for example, the cataclysm and massacre of Chunkush that I wrote about in the Washington Post indeed happened. So, fiction, non-fiction. Mark, the, the first thing I, I would say is a wonderful quote I've always loved from E.M. Forrester. We all know that fiction is truer than history because it goes beyond the evidence. 
There's a certain level of narcissism for a novelist to say that to a room full of scholars. And gosh knows I could not do what I do were it not for historians, but there's a certain element of truth to that. In my family growing up, as the grandson of two survivors of the Armenian Genocide, I always knew from a very, very young age the realities of the Armenian Genocide. What I did not know were the specifics of what Haigui Sharinian, or Levon Nazareth, had endured. There are, it seems to me, at least two kinds of survivors in our families. And that's a simplification, because it's a long spectrum. But there are the survivors who, thank God, wrote down what they witnessed and endured despite the post-traumatic stress disorder of watching parents, grandparents, sisters, brothers, aunts and uncles systematically annihilated. And then there are those of, uh, in our families who were so scarred that they took most of their stories to their graves. So I know, for example, that my grandmother, Haigui Sharinian, and I knew this from a very young age because it was part of the family history, her father had provided cavalry horses to the Ottoman Empire and had for years. In 1915, rather than acquire the horses legally, they simply shot him to death, confiscated the herd, confiscated the family home. My grandfather, Levon Nazareth, we grew up knowing he had three brothers who were alive in Cairo in 1915. What we never knew, because he took the story to his grave, is what happened to them. And to this day, we know nothing of what happened to them. So the Sandcastle Girls is not Heidwig and Levon's story. But exactly as Mark was suggesting, there's an awful lot of autobiographic minutia in that book. Some of it is the dark penumbra that sometimes hung over the Bokchalian house in Tatahoe, New York, because of what Heidwig had endured and what Levon had endured. But there was also the wonderful resiliency and love of that family and those survivors. And that's sort of the yin and the yang of the novel. So, for example, Laura Petrosian is indeed a female version of me. And on page one of the novel, she alludes to her twin brother, a fat kid in red velvet knickers, singing Herman's Hermits with a bad British accent at all of these big, wonderful gatherings of the Armenian family. That fat kid was me. <laughs> I wasn't morbidly obese, but I was so fat that my mother bought, my, bought me all of my pants at a store in Stamford, Connecticut called Greenberg's Husky Boys Shop. <laughs> so the short answer, Mark, is we always knew, we never knew the specifics. Okay. So I was right. You, you were spot on. <laughs> now, talk about just the plot. I want to understand how you plotted this book out. You're sure. The movement in time, the present to past. That way we can understand Eric's challenge in adapting this to a film. So, yeah. so go ahead. You know, the first thing I've got to say about um, Eric and his challenge, and then I want to double back to why the book is structured the way it is, because it gets at two things. First of all, um, Adam Agoyan once said to me when we were talking about Eric and his script of the Sandcastle Girls, Adam said, um, shaking his head in wonderment at Eric, he's the only person in the world I can think of who could have adapted your novel because he's got one foot in Armenian culture and Armenian history and Armenian values and one foot in traditional Hollywood big cinema. In other words, and this is Adam, he can talk with equal eloquence about Gomatas and The Godfather. <laughs> so, why is the Sandcastle Girls structured the way it is, moving back and forth in time between the first person in the present, Laura Petrosian, and a big sweeping epic love story set in Halep, in Aleppo, in 1915. I knew I was not writing this book for our community. We know the stories. Our families endured the stories. I was writing The Sandcastle Girls for women and men in Indianapolis and Jacksonville who could not find Aleppo on a map, even now. 
So the first thing I did was try to frame this part of our history in a story that would appeal certainly to me if I weren't Armenian. I've always loved big, sweeping, epic love stories set in the midst of the cauldron of war. Books such as The English Patient or Atonement or Corelli's Mandolin. So I began with a love story, Elizabeth and Armin Petrosian in Aleppo in 1915. But again, going back to Mark's question, here's the reality. To drop the reader into Aleppo in 1915 would be rather like dropping an awful lot of readers in this country, tragically and sadly, onto Pluto. They would have no context. So the first thing I needed to do was to create a narrator who could say to readers, this cataclysmic, unpunished crime occurred in 1915 and you know nothing about it, and I'm going to give you, and she literally uses this term in the novel, the Armenian Genocide for Dummies. One of those black and yellow books, Microsoft for Dummies, The Violin for Dummies, The Ud for Dummies. But the other thing she can do is this. She can say, don't feel like a dummy because there is a reason why you do not know this story. And that reason is really simple and all of us in this room know that reason. It is denial. It is a century of denial by Turkey, by many of Turkey's allies, and the enablement of many of Turkey's allies. So, I created a first-person narrator to explain to readers this happened. You don't know about it. It's okay. And this is my grandparents' remarkable love story that you need to hear. So talk about Armin and Elizabeth. Who they are. Who are Armin and Elizabeth? Okay, again, writing it for Indianapolis. I'm, I'm writing it for Jacksonville. So that means that, again, I'm stacking the deck to make sure that readers who are not part of our community will embrace this novel. So I begin with an Odar. Elizabeth Endicott, Boston Brahmin's daughter, 1915 Mount Holyoke grad. And I did choose Mount Holyoke by design because, as so many people with Nasser know, Mount Holyoke had a long tradition of sending its remarkable women into Anatolia, and in fact, Elizabeth Endicott was based upon the Mount Holyoke missionary, Grace Knapp, who gave us her memoir, The Tragedy of Beatles. I mean, she's a lot hotter than, than um, Grace Knapp, again by design, because it's an attempt to humanize the past in the present. She goes to Aleppo, and there she meets Armin Petrosian, an Armenian engineer looking for his beloved wife and infant daughter who he's confident, horrified, and terrified have been swallowed by the genocide, but still hopeful. And Armin B meets Elizabeth in Aleppo, and the two fall in love in this innermost ring of Dante's Inferno, Aleppo 1915. And I want to say one more thing about, about Armin Petrosian. There is a trope about men in the Armenian Genocide that we see it in some novels, we see it in some memoirs, we see it in some literature, and it drives me crazy as an Armenian male. And it is this. All of the stories of the Armenian boys dressed by their parents as girls so they might live. The Armenian men trying to pass as women so they might live. When I think of the Armenian men in the genocide, I think first and foremost of Musada. I think first and foremost of the defenders of Vaughn. And so Armin Petrosian, you will see, is of course among the defenders of Vaughn. That's his backstory in the novel before venturing to Harpet, and then to Halep. And I've got to give a shout out to a couple of people who are here in that regard. First of all, to Eric, and we'll talk more about Eric, because Eric's vision for Armin, and Eric's vision for Elizabeth, is so breathtakingly smart and beautiful. And it's one of the reasons why his screenplay is so much better than my novel. And I can say that with absolute confidence, having read his screenplay a lot, and having read seven other screenplays based on my book, so this is not my first rodeo. And I've also give a shout out to two women who are here tonight, 
not Armenian, but have done so much to bring this story to the world. First of all, the ever wonderful Kelly Gilday, who is sitting um, audience right, stage left, who's a producer and director with Random House Audio, and has done amazing work on this audio book, but so many of my others, and an actor named Cassandra Campbell. When you listen to the Sandcastle Girls audiobook, when you hear all of those accents, when you hear all of those voices, when you find yourself in your car, paused, listening to the audiobook because you want to hear one more chapter, one more sentence, that's because of Kelly and Cassandra. If I get Eric and Chris to talk, you know, like shop a little bit here. So, Eric, tell us the challenges of the book and adapting it, and how you changed Armin's kind of the, the, the interior story, where he's, and Chris is, in the way Chris conceives it, he's still searching for his family, even though he, he knows in his heart of hearts that they've perished. And that becomes a motive, and then he falls in love. You have him kind of a, there's some different motivation going on. So let's talk a little bit about that and how and how you've departed from the book in certain ways and certain parallels and everything else. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, my brother. Is this uh, Oh, hey. Try not to deafen you all. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Nasser, to Bruce, to everybody. Uh, we're very happy to do this and to support this amazing organization that has such a deep root, a deep basturma in its veins <laughs> to support the Armenian scholars and research. Um, uh, these two guys on my right and my left are my brothers. I'm, I want to thank my beloved brother Mark for driving all the way from Fresno here to be here tonight with us and to ask these amazing questions and to grace us with this passionate Saroyan ancient Armenian Fresno energy. So I love you, thank you, and his son Joe, who came with him, phenomenal pianist. And I just want to thank the entire board for coming here to support this, because this is important. Without our culture and history and our knowledge, uh, knowledge is power, and, and it's not enough to be Armenian and wave a flag on April 24th. That's very superficial. We don't need any more of that. We will continue to do that. And I hope there's 266,000 of us on April 24th. But just flags are skin deep. There's something much deeper than flags. So knowledge is much more deeper. And so thank you all for supporting these scholars. Um, and I want to thank my beloved brother Chris, who is my brother from my Kai City, uh, Vermont mother, and for being the entire. Uh, I've adapt. I've been very blessed in my life to adapt books of other novelists uh, as I learn my chops. And I know for the rest of my life. This is going to be my most personal and, and, and hopefully the best adaptation I'll ever do because of the love and support and absolute blind trust that this gentleman gave me in the book that he is. It's most personal to him, so it's very, very personal to me. And I thank you, my brother. Um, uh, how can I begin? Um, when I was a kid, my Everything in my life, I, you know, I, we talk about you know, the Armenian chair in studies at UCLA and the USC Institute of Armenian Studies. And, you know, growing up, you know, I, one thing I realized recently, you know, when I lost my grandmother in May, right after April 24th, was, you know, my family was my Armenian Studies Institute. You know, my late beloved ha father Haik in movies and Mamulian and Yavisha Charent and my aunt Parik Nazarian with Komitas and Kelelao and Subkarapet and Bingyo. So I grew up in a family that worshipped, loved, and absolutely effortlessly embraced culture the way they embraced Dolma. <laughs> I didn't need to prove myself as an Armenian in my elementary schools. And it all had to do with the printed books that they brought with them. We came to this country with five suitcases. Three of them were books and records of Komitas and Charnets and those old green Soviet Armenian encyclopedias. So this was my shelter. This was my bulletproof vest. And I'm very proud to say I went to a public school, several, and I went to USC. I know the other school, Karma. Kar <laughs> but um, just to go back to after my salutations and respects, of course, um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, growing up, movies, you know, 
They were every day, every weekend we saw a movie. Cool Hat Luke, Charlie Chaplin, Limelight, The Godfather, West Side Story, Papillon, Steve McQueen. And this very weird, strange movie about Armenians called America, America. If you look at America, America, the first hour is about Armenians. And that was the first time that it just planted that seed and it abandoned me. I was maybe nine or ten and I saw it. At, you know, at a very a VHS, very old VHS copy, dubbed from like second or third generation. And then in 1994, I was a senior in high school, and um, I went to see Schindler's List on a Saturday matinee in Glendale. And there was a moment when, in that film, the black and white, that little girl in red appears. And it was the first time where I think I got a minor panic attack. I was 17 at the time. And then when they the scene when they put the close-up shot of the um, needle on the vinyl and then they start to take all these kids from their parents. And that was like the first shot in the head of like, something I gotta tell the story of the Armenian genocide. And that was really the kind of, it was the kick in the stomach. And you know, so I dedicated my life to cinema uh, and I'm very proud of that then, all thanks to my father and my family for their support and love and encouragement of the arts. But when I, and all these years when I was at USC film school, I wrote all these, my thesis script was about Harapa, war, about these children that lost their voices. And I was trying to crack the Armenian story, but I was so confused. I was studying Armin Wegener, I was studying Komitas, Arshil Kork, Ivan H. Miyazi in New York. And I was just confused because it was an elephant. How the hell am I going to make these movies? I mean, who the hell is going to sponsor these movies, finance these movies, invest? So it was a period of like 10 years, 15 years of asking myself, trying to ask myself the right questions. And what happened was in 2012, thanks to our dear beloved godfather, Khaji Kuratyan, um, Khaji kept telling me about this magnificent novel that's coming out that I was absolutely going to eat up and love. And I just kept saying, when, 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 when? And, and it was literally in 2012 when you know, I got the book sent to me and I read, I think I was on page 45, and I just dropped the book. I called Hachi. I said, Hachi, I'm going to move heaven and earth. I'm going to rob every bank in this world, and I'm going to make this movie. And that was the spark. And why? Because he did something no other author has done for me about an Armenian subject. And when I read things, anything I read, my brain translated in terms of shots. And when I started the introduction with the Ottoman Annex and Laura Petrosian and Bronxville, New York, it was all first person. So my brain, the projector in my mind, starts to process the story from a first person POV of this woman taking her daughter and her husband and talking about the genocide and all these incredibly well-versed, it was like a stream of consciousness. You know, first person. So I kept seeing the movie as a first person close up of the 20, 21st century. And then suddenly the chapter changes and bam, we're in Aleppo, third person. It's the omniscient narrator. And so the camera comes back and you start to see the canvas of what this desert was, what it was like, the origins, the first moment, the first wave when those women came into Aleppo, starved, broken, dark, and blackened by the sun, with feet that looked like the elephantitis. And the thing that really killed me was that this, it was not enough that it was a great story, but that it had a cinematic indigenous component to it narratively. And that was the mystery of this mysterious photograph that appears in Harvard University Peabody Museum after nearly a century of being completely lost in a German archive somewhere in Germany. And the linchpin to use that photograph as a narrative device, as the main center of gravity to tell that story, to be able to move back and forth in time. Because the one thing I never wanted to do with an Armenian genocide film is, I never wanted to make a genocide film that stays in the past. Because the genocide continues today. And January 19, 2007 was the day after April 24th, 1915. And this was becoming more and more relevant to me that I don't want to make a movie that's just going to get stuck in the past. It's going to be a period piece because we Armenians get one or two, maybe three shots at this. And for some reason, I felt that there was this incredible burden of responsibility of getting it right or just don't do it at all. 
So I honestly didn't care about the 100th anniversary. I respect it, I worship it, I support it, I'm there. I was in Istanbul on the 100th anniversary. But I was not gonna rush this movie in order to be symbolic. You know, nobody asked Steven Spielberg or Polanski, was this the 65th anniversary of the Holocaust? Was it the 74th? Was it the 111th? A good movie does its job timelessly, and it really doesn't matter when you make that movie. When you make that movie is when you're supposed to make it. When the actors are there, the money's there, and you have a family of brothers and samurai that are gonna go to hell and back to make sure you get your every single shot, because we do not get a second chance. And because it was his most personal book, you know, I knew I had to set all my responsibilities aside and really focus on breaking this magnificent cow into a filet mignon. You know, because you read the book, and it, it's so epic, it's sweeping, and I've read the book 11 times now. And then Which I, is 10 more than I have. <laughs> so it was really, for me, the, um, thank you, officer. It was really, for me, trying to understand Armin and Elizabeth's character, and what's, what Chris did so magnificently is that he wove this tale of this kind of man who's lost it all, this wandering samurai who comes back from Vaughn, and the people that he trusted, the family that he knew was going to be safe, it's gone. And it's the eternal 20th century Armenian desperate icon of a man or a woman looking for their family. It's Odysseus, it's the tale of the journey, it's the road movie, it's the epic. And I was scared because I needed to earn the right to write this story. And as a film, I felt in me, channeling myself through Armin, Armin's obsession is to find his wife and child, but I think my version of Armin felt consumed by blind rage and the need for vengeance. And this became the arc of how do you go beyond the magnitude of something you cannot imagine? How do you take that journey? How do you end up looking for your wife? It's funny, isn't it? Like you, you go looking for things in your life to places that you've never been, whether it's your ancestry or something new, and then you find something you never expected. Well, that's what Armin Petrosian did. He goes to Aleppo looking for Karin and his daughter, but he finds this woman who ultimately uh, becomes some type of an anchor in his desperation and in his blind vengeance. And I needed this love story to be difficult it, because you've lost you know, your immediate family. You don't just fall in love. And that's what I think Chris handled brilliantly and he gave me the anchor. He loaded the basis for me to be able to break the narrative. And that was my biggest challenge was to break the first person, third person narrative so that it wasn't like the hours. Has anybody seen that movie, The Meryl Streep? And, yeah, so it was really important for me to find that arc and to be able to really ask the question, why do we choose to continue? And really to paint a picture of a level 1915 that we haven't seen and to make it more contained and more character driven as opposed to much more expansive and like Lawrence of Arabia. Did I answer your question, Rob? You did, you did. <laughs> So serpentine, but you did. Okay. Um, beautiful. We're going to open it up for some questions. A couple more little things here. Chris, I don't know if anyone who's written a book who's happy with the film or the screenplay. They think it's like an evisceration of what they did. But, I mean, you're... He, he's taken some of your babies and killed them, in a way, as ideas, right? And... You're happy with it, and I actually see the strength of his narrative. It could only be done that way. So talk a little bit about that. Um, was it difficult at all, or you saw the wisdom in what he was doing right away? Eric's script is spectacular. I love every moment of this film. Um, but it was an education for me. It was my own miniature master class in filmmaking. When you hang around with Eric and talk about film, it's really fun and really interesting. So, um, when Eric was distilling a 300-page novel into a 100-minute film, he had to make at least two kinds of decisions. He first all had to figure out what is not going to be in the film, because there simply isn't time, and how do you 
tell things on a film that are conveyed in a book via internal monologue? How do you convey what Armin is thinking or what Elizabeth is thinking? How do you do that on film? And so some of the things that he did and are, that are there are so wonderful. Mark alluded to the first time we see Elizabeth in the novel. And the first time we see Elizabeth in the novel, she's a 22-year-old woman who's collapsing, um, prostrate with heat, and suddenly sees the column of Armenian women marching into Aleppo. A moment, it's just for the record, that comes from the historical record, thank you, Jesse B. Jackson, American Council in Aleppo, who wrote of that particular moment. It's one sentence in one cable, but it was the opening for Elizabeth in the novel. Eric has elevated that scene instead because you have so little time in a film, and you've immediately got to introduce who are these people in ways that you can't uh, you can't, you, it, they are very different from a novel. So in the first time you see Elizabeth in the film, a physician sees a healthy young woman in Aleppo, surrounded by all of these Armenian women dying, and he says, do you know how to thread? Are you a nurse? I need help, because this is an innermost string of Dante's Inferno. And all of a sudden, this 22-year-old Boston Brahmin's daughter in Aleppo, Syria, for the first time in her life, has to rise to the occasion or fail. And it is an utterly riveting scene. Or here's an example of one of my darlings was killed and resurrected in a way in film that is so interesting. And again, a master class. There's a small character in the novel named Peter Vartanian. Peter Vartanian is a very elegant, reserved, Armenian from Beirut. He's a scholar who's working at Alma, and in the novel, he's in his mid-30s and very, very refined. In the screenplay, he's older, and he swears like a sailor, <laughs> and I can remember saying to Eric, why, why? I mean, I like this character, but you know, what's the method behind the madness? And Eric explained to me, and he's completely right. This is a small character. It's three or four minutes of the movie. But it is a gem of a role for a character actor who's willing to do this, somebody like Alan Arkin. He said, imagine Alan Arkin speaking these lines. And all of a sudden, I looked at the scene that was um, so different from the book and realized I loved it every second of the exchanges between this new elderly um, Armenian named Peter Vartanian, who is more likely to be at Fenway Park than the part Peter Vartanian in my novel, and realized it's spot on. And Eric's screenplay is filled with that sort of heart and soul that is based, again, on to quote Adam Agoyan, on the way that he is one foot with Gomatas and one foot with the Godfather. One day, Eric and I were in Western Armenia, and we were traveling between Van and Diyarbakir, and there were seven of us in the van, and we spent 90 minutes trying to come up with films and stump him. We were unable to. He the only time he almost tripped was when he could only name six of the seven actors in the Mercury Space Program in The Right Stuff. <laughs> okay, you, you mentioned that trip. That trip came after you wrote the book. Yeah, the first time I went to Western Armenia was actually after I had written The Sandcastle Girls, yes. But before you wrote the screenplay, or during the process of writing the screenplay? After. After, too. Would that trip of knowing what you saw, would it have changed your book at all? Would it have changed your script at all? Would it have changed the book at all? It might have. I like to say, I would like to say no, but when you are actually standing in Harpert, when you are actually in the fortress looking down, it was the Rose City in Vaughan, when you are looking at the remains of one of the churches, any of, you know, Garmavak or Varank, any of the churches in Vaughan that have not been restored, that are subjected to desecration and vandalism on a daily basis, um, you feel very, very differently and so I think the, the novel might have been different. I don't know how it would have it's been a different. Question. I know. 
Yeah, I, I don't know how it would have been different. Um, it is entirely possible, however, that the brief scenes in Harpent might have been different. It is entirely possible that the rage that Armin is feeling in the granary, granary in Vaughn might have been even more pronounced, if that's possible. Yeah. How about you, Eric? I mean, I think, um, well, our first tour that we did, the first trip, actually, thanks to our brother, Hachik Moradian, he said, I'm going to organize the Sandcastle Girls Western Armenia trip so we can go to the places where the book takes place and the film will take place. And I think for us, it was really to kind of hit pause on the book and the script and the film and just jump in head first into the silence of Western Armenia, into these ruins, into the defiance of nature. I mean, going to Garminavank or Gaduts or going to Varakavank, you know, going to Lije, you know, Lije is like the front line of the Kurds and the Turkish PKK. Like right now, there's no way in hell we could go to Lije. And going to Lije and seeing these ancient, like, 15th century Armenian gravestones, still there, still just defying nature. It was really, you know, this is the most important research you do, and we're talking about scholars and, you know, the National Association of Scholars and Research. You know, the, the amount of research in the books that I've had to read and Chris has had to read, like we've, and when I did our, my first talk at NASA with Mark in 2012, you know, in Belmont, you know, I have to say, like, it's so important the preservation of history because, you know, everything that Ian Forster says absolutely makes sense. Uh, everything that we do, we try to authenticate it, but, you know, fiction hits something as on a human emotional truth that nonfiction can't. There, there are no scenes in the novel of Armin actually traveling through Anatolia. There's a scene, there's scenes of him in Harpert, and then there's scenes of him in Aleppo. In Eric's remarkable screenplay, there are absolutely riveting, riveting scenes of Armin as he's making his way from Harpert to Aleppo, often, often um, with Turkish killing parties or Kurdish killing parties right on his tail. And I think some of those scenes, when I think of your screenplay, I think of when we would be walking in some of those very, very spots. Absolutely. And you still get that sense. I mean, there were areas we would enter where there's that Turkish word, gyoz, the eye. It just triggers you. And there's a deep look of that eye. And you have no idea where that eye is coming from. But you do realize they know where you are. They know where you're from. And they're not going to do anything. They're just going to make sure that you know that you are trespassing on your own land. So there was these elements that we felt that we weren't looking for, we weren't expecting, and we pretty, pretty much had a pretty damn, very solid, smooth time of very empathetic people that said, you know, when we were in... Yeah, but was it the second time or the first time, first time. That, that our, our Kurdish driver, Zulkuf Tawri, um, when they realized he was a Kurdish driver from Darabakir, the Turkish soldiers, gave him hell. Yes. That was the second time? Second time, yeah. yeah. First time, we had no problem. First time we found Asiya which Chris wrote that magnificent yeah, that was a beautiful article. piece. Beautiful I mean, that piece. was the most emotional time of no dry eyes. I mean, that day was a bloodbath of tears for all of us because we saw the living genocide in front of our eyes. And it was straight out of a movie. You can read Chris's article. I won't waste your time now re-paraphrasing it very sloppily. But what he wrote in the Washington Post is one of the biggest works of poetry. And I think, you know, in my notebook I wrote, you know, when I was in high school, there was this quote by Hunter S. Thompson that really stabbed me, and he said, all my life I've tried to find that which I cannot name. And when you make a movie about the genocide, about your people, about anything that's personal, there's something so deep you cannot name. You're hoping the poetry, you're hoping that fiction reaches that, the way Yerisha Charans reached it, the way Pasternak reached it with Dr. Zhivago, the way all these novels, the way you know, Mark's work has affected me for over the years. It's always this fear that you don't want to let the facts trump this. Like in Hollywood, we say, don't let the facts get in the way of telling a good story. I didn't have that luxury. I had to make sure I was talking to every single scholar from Tanner Akcham to Raymond Kevorkian to even people who are controversial because I wanted to make sure when this movie is done, I'm going to war and I'm ready to answer all your questions with references and get ready because there's going to be zero, zero room for error for this. And if there is, it's on me and I'm responsible for it.
And so this journey, so, making this journey was important. I'll wrap up right now. I can shut up so you can ask the questions. Making that journey, I think, was more important for me after writing the script. Um, I think I would have had much more anger and rage yeah, yeah. than if I had gone before. I probably would have written a very... I don't know what I would have to be honest. You would have written something magnificent. Yeah. Okay, let's open it up for some questions. Yes? Uh, I know absolutely nothing about movies or writing or screenplay. Uh, my question is, uh, what role does the director have uh, related to uh, the screenwriter? Uh, what role does the director have in uh, changing, projecting, or bringing the writer and screenplay writer's uh, vision to the uh, screen? Well, in this case, we have two and one, so go ahead. Uh, the question was, what role does the director have in bringing the author's or screenwriter's vision to the screen? Did I paraphrase that right? Um, the director is basically the orchestra conductor, the violinist, the audience member, the cheerleader, and the water boy. He has to basically translate that vision um, that is written on the page as a blueprint onto the screen. And so basically, if you look at an analogy, I can say, look at an orchestra. You have you know, the orchestra conductor and you have all the musicians. And then the orchestra conductor brings the text, which is the music that's written. And the orchestra conductor's job is to make sure everybody in that orchestra is doing their job. The bassoon, the oboe, the drums, you know, the, the trumpet, the trombone, in order to create the melody, which is the movie in the end product. Does that make sense? Since yes, I have the microphone, and I'll bring it to okay, whoever okay. so you can hear. But could I could I ask, um, where are you in the process of developing the film? You've been talking about the screenplay. What's yeah, we start casting very very soon. Is that all you want to say? Script. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very superstitious, but I will say that this movie is going forward. It's getting made, and. You know, anything, it's like Stanley Kubrick said, you know, making a movie is like conducting a symphony in a bumper car ride. You know, we have, the problem with making this movie is 85 percent, 80% is set in Derzor. And there was nowhere, in, anywhere in the Middle East I could shoot for the past three, four years. So it's been a very big challenge finding the right partners that have a desert that looks like Derzor, that you can authenticate. Uh, and also, I just want to make a shout out to my dear friend and executive producer, Karan Setian, who's here with us tonight, uh, who's joined us today. And we're incredibly uh, blessed after all this time to be moving forward. Um, there's a lot of work ahead of us, and we look forward to it. And I genuinely think some of the most awesome, challenging, and the best days of our lives are ahead of us. And my hope is that I do Chris proud and our ancestors proud in a way that you know, can fulfill this vision from the page to the screen. And we're not going to do it unless we do it our way in the right way, without being pompous, without being self-righteous, without being symbolic. We need to make a good movie that tells a great story. And he did the hardest lifting. Yeah. I'd like to know, uh, Chris, what inspired you to write your first book? And I'd like to know if your father lived his to see the sand her, to hear or read the sandcastle girls. Okay, Gilberta, um, 42 times you've been to Yerevan, right? right. Yeah, Gilberta, who asked this question, has been to Yerevan 42 times. <laughs> she was, two questions. What inspired me to write my first novel, and did my father live to see the sandcastle girls? The first novel I wrote is the single worst first novel ever published, bar none. <laughs> there is no book worse than a killing in the real world. And here's why I wrote it. I was writing short stories and sending them in my 20s to The New Yorker or The Sewanee Review or Harper's and being summarily and consistently rejected. When I got rejection slip number 250, I thought to myself, huh, plan A, not working. Time to try plan B. In this era, Cosmopolitan was still publishing a lot of fiction. So I rounded up six months worth of Cosmopolitan magazines and read them over a weekend. And then I wrote what I thought was the perfect cosmopolitan short story. It's about a female supermodel living in Lower Manhattan in a spectacular apartment with a hugely wealthy arbitrage trader. 
But their marriage is a little bit dicey, so on weekend she goes out to their equally cool beach house in Fire Island to see if the marriage can be saved. Instead, however, she plays scantily clad beach volleyball, cosmopolitan bought it. First story I ever sold. And when it appeared in print, all of the sudden literary agents started approaching me and they all were saying the same thing, do you have a novel? And I didn't. And the reason why I didn't is because I wanted the immediate gratification of short stories. I was never one of those young writers at the feet of Raymond Carver or Laurie Moore in the short story. I always loved the doorstops, the 40 days of Musada, Les Miserables, Anna Karenina. Those were the books that I loved. So I sat down and wrote a novel. And it began as an autobiographic novel about graduates of some Western Massachusetts colleges brought together in New York City, but when one of their peers winds up dead on the front page of the New York Post. When my agent read it, she said, I think I can sell this if you add some more sex and violence. So I did. <laughs> After 250 rejection slips before I sold a short story, this book went out for auction and sold on the first day. It had multiple offers. The offer I accepted was from a publisher, uh, an editor at St. Martin's, who said, you know, I, I kind of like this book, but I think you do need to add more sex and violence. <laughs> so I did. When I saw the first print run for this book, I said to my editor, this book can't possibly earn out its advance. What will it take to earn out the advance? What do I have to do? And he said, die. <laughs> Young dead novelists sell well. So that was my first novel. Now, um, a few years later, after I'd published four novels, I made my first attempt to write a novel of the Armenian Genocide. It was a terrible, terrible book for different reasons, and about this time, Carol Edgadian's remarkable novel, Rise of the Euphrates, was published. And so I never published the first time I tried to write about the Armenian Genocide. I wasn't sure if I was going to try again. On February 2nd, 2010, while I was having a cup of coffee with a gentleman who, Eric, whose name Eric has mentioned, Hachik Madadian, Hachik said to me, when are you going to try again? because he knew about my first attempt to write this part of our story. And when Hachik says to you, when, it's your marching orders. And so I said to Hachik, and this is a shout out to everyone at NASA, I said, okay, I'm willing to try, but I need you to have my back as one of the smartest human beings I will ever met, and one of the most knowledgeable people I know about this subject. And he said, sure. And every step of the way when I was writing The Sandcastle Girls, Hachik had my back. I remember one time saying to him, I'm not finding what I need to know about the Baghdad Railway. I, I can't find anything in English that's going to help me anywhere. Um, and he immediately, and this is, I was in northern Vermont, he immediately went and Xeroxed at least three chapters from two books, and a few days later, because you know, these are stuff that's not online, they arrived in my mailbox in Vermont. That's the kind of great friend that Hotchik is. Now, did my father ever see the Sandcastle Girls? No, he died the summer before it was published. And because of his macular degeneration for the last um, five years of his life, he only listened to my books on audio, which might be one of the reasons on some unconscious level, and I've never thought about this, that I just revere the work of people like Kelly Gilday and Cassandra Campbell because of the great pleasure that I gave my, they gave my father as for the last five years of his books, he'd listen to books on audio. So now my father knew I was writing it, but he never read it or heard it. A couple more questions. Yes. I might have misunderstood. Thank you. I might have misunderstood, but did you say that you there were actually seven scripts that you read? And um, the question: the, there were seven times in my life when my books have either been optioned for movies or become movies. So uh, you know, I've read the scripts for the finished movies, Midwives and Secrets of Eden and Past the Bleachers, and I've read drafts of scripts, I've read scripts for four of my other books that were never produced. 
And my point of mentioning that is that I've read a lot of scripts. I'm a novelist, but I've read scripts. And so that's why when I read what Eric had written, I was absolutely blown away by its poignancy, its power, its majesty, and the way it transcended what I did in a novel. This question is for Eric. I'm going to be a hog for a second. Who would you envision would play the lead characters if you had your brothers and you had a big budget? Who would the lead characters be played by? Marlon Brando at age 21 and Julie Christie at age 18. <laughs> You know, honestly, and again, I, I, I swear to you, I'm not being cagey or anything. Um, one of the big things for me is scheduling. It's very difficult to schedule a motion picture of this scale. So it's really a Rubik's Cube between the right crew, all my brothers and sisters, and I will tell you, we are going to be shooting in Spain. Spain will be substituting for their Zor. My very dear, loyal San Sebastian brothers and sisters who have been with me since 2007 on my first film where I had nothing to my name, uh, begged, borrowed, cheated, steal, and thanks to my family, I was able to make the Blue Hour premiere in Basque Country, uh, first Armenian in that festival as a first time where they had my back from day one. They knew our story, and this movie is not going to happen without that kind of loyalty that I have here around me. So mainly right now it's trying to understand some very, very good names. Unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to discuss, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, because I've discussed and I've promised their representatives until we get the finalization forms. Uh, but, I mean, I think, you know, you have these amazing actors like the Cersei Ronans, you know, and the Jake Gyllenhaals, and, you know, these young actors that are independent friendly, that want to move their career to another level. See, what's happened now is these big actors like the Robert Pattinsons and the Kirsten Stewarts do these big movies like the Twilight franchise, and they realize for the rest of their lives they're pigeonholed. So they throw everything away, and they go back to independent movies, and they want to get their feet dirty. And this movie will not be cast with anybody with a big name that's not ready to get their feet dirty. Uh, it's not that kind of a movie. It's not that kind of a budget. Um, although we will be very competitive and we will execute what we need to execute based on what our partners have and the trust and the loyalty that they have in us and in this project. But ultimately for me, this is the biggest, the hardest thing that Hitchcock said is casting the movie. And this is why I don't want to rush this. I really want to be careful. And I really want to make sure the scheduling is correct. Because we have to make sure that we get one shot. And if we don't make this count, you know, I, I won't be able to live with myself. I'll be a killing in the real world. <laughs> Never. Never. Thank you, Carla. I'm inviting you back up to. Oh. Thank you so much. To the table, ask her some questions, and until next time, please join us for the next event. Thank you, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Mark. Actually, we we have a uh, good evening. I know that it's uh, been a long evening, but a very interesting one, so I promise to be short and sweet. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. It uh, really warms my heart as a New Englander to, uh, to be here and to, to be enveloped in your warmth and welcoming. Uh, we appreciate your, your devotion to Nasser. And we hope that those of you who are not leadership members will consider it. Uh, really, I, it really makes me feel good. And, and for those of you who don't know, I was the chairman of NASA for nine years. Uh, I was the chairman right after Manogyan uh, finished up his 47 years as the chairman of NASA. So uh, NASA is very dear to my heart. My great uncle was one of the founding members of Nasser, so it's, it's very important to me. I do want to thank the board members, Bruce Rode, Greg Katabjan, and Rupin Barbarian, and their committees for all their hard work and dedication in making this such a wonderful evening. And I do want to thank 
they disappeared. Our panelists and Carla, uh, I want to thank Chris, Eric, and Ma uh, Mark for their work uh, this evening. It really was quite enlightening and we appreciate their work. And on behalf of NASA, I would like to present them. Bruce has some books. We have some books from, of course, NASA's bookstore. Uh, it's entitled Armenia, uh, Masterpieces from an Enduring Culture by Theo von Lind and Robin Meyer. And if you would pre please present them to them, I would appreciate it. Thank you. And know that I was a former uh, Spanish teacher and I lived and studied in Spain and San Sebastián is very near and dear to my heart, the Basque region. So if you need a translator, I will do it gratis. Uh, again, thank you all so much and we do have some brochures out front and we do hope that you will consider coming to the East Coast on November 12th. Uh, I am chairing the banquet and I'm planning some things for those of you who are coming here because it's not just about going to a banquet, but it's also about seeing what we have to offer on the East Coast. So I hope that you will consider coming and thank you all so much. Thank you.